Did you know that God really only has one law? So many religious factions have different instructions, rules, and regulations. But the only law that really matters is love. God's Only Law with host Bill Cohen shares that one true law. Here's Bill. Welcome back. The love story we are exploring is built on God's law of love, and Jesus is at the center of the story throughout the Bible. What does God tell us about Jesus' two appearances? One of the most critical themes in the Old Testament points to Jesus' first appearance. He came that first time as the Lamb of God, and the Old Testament provided over 300 prophecies about Jesus' first appearance. Jesus wants us to know that people would not believe in him unless they believed what the Old Testament told us about Moses and the prophets. So in Luke we hear, And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. God gives us the free will to ignore his prophecies or to use them to elevate our faith. He wants us to know Jesus is the eternal king and he came to show us his form of reigning, love, not force, as he told us in Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh to thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt of a foil of an ass. And he is patient enough to wait for us to accept his offer. He will not force it upon us. Part of the great mystery of Christ is that so many people choose to deny the truth, even some who witnessed his miracles, his healing power, his resurrections of the dead, and the fact that this life is better when we live his law of love. So we learn about one of his miracles in John. And when he thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave cloths and his face was bound upon with a napkin. Jesus said unto him, Loose him, and let him go. Many today ignore the historical evidence of Jesus' existence and his sacrifice on the cross, even though plenty of non-Christian references from that period are available today. If Jesus is the Messiah, could anything in this life be more important than examining the evidence? Yet mysteriously, people refuse to consider the evidence and accept unfounded rumors instead. We can all agree that there is a dispute about which names we should use in our calendar. A.D., B.C., B.C.E., C.E. I have wrestled with the dispute and continued to wonder why removing any reference to God from these names is so important to some people. B.C. was first used because they wanted to distinguish between the period before Christ and the A.D. period after he first appeared to us. Anno Domini in Latin, or in the year of the Lord, in English. Both Dionysius Exodus and Pope Gregory VIII tried to sync the calendar with God's created cycles of seasons. Their primary purpose was to accurately identify Easter Sunday for future years. Hundreds of years later, in the, during the Age of Enlightenment, a period in which some were desperately trying to remove God from their lives and everyone else's lives, produced the period replacement names BCE, before the current age, and CE, current age. This period also brought us the false nar narrative of evolution for the same reason. What good has all of our disobedience produced? We can think of this world as our chance to experience both heaven and hell. When we are working together to complete God's family by living his law of love, everything works together to bring us Jesus' peace and everyone benefits from our behavior. This is the convergent space where heaven and earth kiss. When we do not love God, we think everything should work together for our own benefit. Selfishness rules our hearts. This is where earth and hell converge to produce pain and suffering. It is our disobedience, foolishly displayed, that turns this world into our temporary hell, causing some of us to take our own lives. We, therefore, are deciding our own eternal future by choosing to either obey or disobey God's law of love. And we cannot love him or keep his commandments if we do not believe he exists, as we learn in Hebrews. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Jesus came to help us understand him and the Bible. He fully explained his mission, 
We cannot pretend he came for any other purpose. C.S. Lewis tells us in the, his book, Mere Christianity, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him, and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. We can use God's word and his prophecies to establish our faith, but only when we are drawn to his love, which is what he tells us in John. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. One of the most significant themes in the New Testament points us to Jesus' second coming. He wants us to prepare for eternity. And once we learn God wants to spend eternity with us, we are no longer in a hurry to have our own way, and we can relax and live his selfless law of love. When Jesus returns, it will be as the Lion of Judah, bringing the host of heaven, a trump shall announce his coming, and those who have chosen to ignore him will mourn, as they watch those who decided to accept him rise to meet him in the sky, as told to us in Matthew. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. It will be like the day Noah entered the ark after 120 years of building it. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Apparently, a hundred and twenty years of warnings were not enough for the people of Noah's days. Hopefully, two thousand years have been enough for us. In Matthew, we are told that when we step before our Lord and Savior on the judgment day, we will hear either, His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Or... And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in equity. In this life, we will choose which of these two greetings we will receive. Jesus wants all of us to be, choose to be with him forever. However, he will not force any of us to love him, as he told us in Ezekiel. Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Jesus did not die on the cross and ascend from the grave for no reason. These two events are the most profound moments in all human history. The reason for them is no less profound. He did these things so that we might have a choice. God wants us to know he resurrected Jesus and he desires to do the same for us. So he told us in 1 Corinthians, And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Otherwise, we have only the hopelessness that has led so many of us to take our own lives because we no longer want to live in this world. So what is Jesus doing now? In John, he tells us he is preparing a place for each of us in his Father's house. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also. In Matthew, he tells us he has shortened this earth's history. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Because Jesus' return will come before humanity has the chance to annihilate itself, which became possible when we dropped the first atomic bomb. 
Jesus continues to inspire us to spread his word to the uttermost part of the earth. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Today, many of God's servants are working hard to fulfill this prophecy, and it will be completed soon. God had Daniel give us this prophecy. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So, 2,500 years later, we might experience their fulfillment, and thus have our faith bolstered by air travel becoming commonplace and the Internet's continuing to make knowledge more accessible. Jesus is patiently waiting for the correct number of us to prepare ourselves for the wedding to come, as he told us in Revelation. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And it will be a giant celebration. He already knows who among us will choose to live with him, but he also knows we need to go through the sanctification process, like David and Moses and Saul did before they were fit for his kingdom. So he patiently waits for us. We could choose to remain trapped in our doubt, or we could allow Jesus to teach us God's wisdom, which will then lead us to this truth being hidden amongst the lies of this world. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and umbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Jesus is doing exactly what he needs to do. He is calling us to come home to him. Next week, we will continue this love story by examining what God means when he asks us to repent from our evil ways. God wants us to test every part of this story, for he is not looking for lukewarm followers, only truth seekers who are looking for a perfect love. Comments, opposing opinions, and suggestions for future topics are all welcome. Just send me an email, bill at reasoningwithgod.com. May the blessings of God overwhelm your week.